No, I'm so sorry. Okay, there you awesome. go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I was a cloud architect as well before joining um, AWS. Um, and I've been with AWS for about two years now. Um, I was also a technical account manager or a TAM uh, before joining the solutions architect organization. So very nice to meet you all. Uh, just a quick brief about me. Uh, so today's session is going to be about databases on AWS. And um, Kiki database uh, service provide Kore AWS. We'll go over that. And uh, we'll go over uh, some of the use cases as well. To, uh, and we will go over some of the sample questions later on. But um, let me move on um, and we'll go over the agenda quickly. As, uh, as I was saying, uh, I'm like to overview Debo on the AWS database services, uh, what, are, what are available today. Uh, we'll also provide um, an overview on the traditional versus the AWS model. Um, and, 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 and we were just discussing that a few minutes ago. Uh, Albeda Bhai was talking about it. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we'll also talk about the relational databases on AWS. Um, there will be a short quiz, uh, um, just to go over some of the concept that we discussed on the previous slides. Then we'll go into NoSQL databases. Then there will be another quiz after that. Tapuramrakta summary corbo. Then we'll have a, a real sample uh, exam questions. We'll go over some of those. And then we'll wrap up. And there might, if we have some time, we'll discuss some additional topics as well. Okay, so let's move on. So AWS database services. Um, as you may know already, there's quite a few AWS database services. Uh, there is the managed relational database services. There's also cloud native relational database services. So I'll go over the difference between the two. Um, the, petabyte, the petabyte scale data warehouse. So this is mostly from data warehousing and how you can scale up to, to peta, petabyte in, in, in seconds, in minutes. Uh, then there's also a fully managed key value and document uh, database, which is Amazon DynamoDB. Um, then we'll also have um, what we offer is in-memory key value store with Amazon Elastic Cache. Um, a new one that was added, I would say at least a year or a couple of years ago is Amazon Neptune, which is a fully managed graph database. A lot of you may be familiar with GraphQL database. Uh, so it's the, the same thing uh, that's a managed database offered by AWS called Amazon Neptune. Um, and then we also have three more databases uh, that services that were also added since um, I would say the last reInvent as well, or they reInvent before, uh, before last year. Um, so fully managed time series database, that's another service, database service that's offered by AWS. Uh, then you also have fully managed ledger database and a MongoDB compatibility da database document DB. For the sake of this, um, for this uh, uh, session today, and keeping in mind the ultimate goal of a AWS associate uh, solutions architect uh, certificate exam, AMI cover Corbo only the topics that will be uh, close or, or relevant to that exam. Uh, there are a few database services that we'll talk about in the additional topic section if we have time, but mostly we'll focus on uh, the services that you need to know in order to take the exam and the concepts that you would have to know to take that exam. So just an FYI. All right, so let's move on. Um, so Ekanamra, uh, next subsequent slide, we'll talk about the traditional versus AWS data services model, right? There has been um, Oracle uh, offering databases, Microsoft offering databases, and also what AWS is now offering. So the model is, is a little bit different, right? As you already know, and some of you have already mentioned it as well. So what are those, right? So in terms of the traditional database, right, uh, we have the client here, 
right? Obviously, then we have the, the application or the web tier, right? And then we have the um, RDBMS, which is the relational database management system, right? Um, one database for all workloads, right? Whether you have a web application or, or you're trying to build a, a custom application, whether that's a, a e-commerce e web application or a video on demand web application, doesn't matter. You only have one database for all workloads, right? That's what traditional database architecture used to offer. Um, and, and that, that what those, what the, some of those benefits I would say, or, or, or disadvantages of having those were, right? Um, some of them were key value access, right? Then you had to write like complex queries because your application didn't really uh, fit into that database model, right? Maybe you needed a NoSQL database, right? But a non-relational database, but you now have to work with a relational database, right? So you had to have complex queries running all the time. And then uh, maybe you had OLAP transaction uh, analytics, which is which is which is big right now. Uh, so all these were forced into the relational database model, right? And this is where AWS came in, and the model for AWS changed on the data tier, right? So what are those data tier, right? That we focused on. And then we bought up those eight database services, Jitami Agar Slider Dakar Chilam, right? Um, there, is, there is a use case for each of those database services, right? So what are those? Let's go through that a little bit, right? Um, on the data tier, you may have a use case for caching, right? You may have a use case for warehousing, right? Um, or maybe you may have a use case for time series database. All you care about is logging the times, right? Um, then you may, may need a blob storage, right? Or you may need a NoSQL database. Uh, and there's a few more, right? Uh, quantum ledger, then there's search, right? All you need to do in your database query is search and put the results back into the web or the client application, right? So. That is the model, the data tier architecture that AWS looked at, not only from ourselves, but um, feedback and, and customer recommendation as well. What were our customers saying? So then we went in and said like, okay, let's focus on what can we bring up where it's a workload driven data store, right? Not about you know one size fits all, right? Acta Genish to fit everything. No, like let's look at the workload, let's look at the, the use case and then we will we'll come up with the services, right? So here like, you know, what, what, is, what is cache, right? We have the hot reads in, in cache, right? Uh, no SQL requires simple query, right? You don't need complex query. You just need to run some simple query, right? Data warehouse, requires analytics, you need analytics, you need, you need insights into your data, you need insights into what your customers are doing. So you would need data warehousing, right? For blob storage, it's logging. Uh, to do search, it's, uh, you know, any sort of search, uh, whether it's complex or, or even like, you know, search through thousands of thousands of data, right? Um, complex queries and transaction would be the relational database, right? Um, uh, untampered data would be quantum ledger, and then periodic data would be time series, right? So these are the use cases for workload driven architect, uh, uh, driven store selection. Um, so let's go and map this to what AWS services are offered from a database perspective, right? A lot of you had this question, um, just prior to starting this session, Ebom Kyokyo, I saw uh, put this question in the in the Slack channel as well. Is is I'm confused, right? What are these services really mean, uh, and how does it tie back, right? So hopefully this slide will bring some clarity. So in terms of NoSQL and simple query, you have Amazon DynamoDB, right? And for graph. QL or graph queries, key value, you would have Neptune, right? That's the first use case there. Um, 
for any sort of hot reads, right, where you need to read data um, very fast. You cannot tolerate latency or you cannot wait. Your application cannot wait, right? Uh, that is where you would have elastic cache, right? Um, for any sort of analytics in terms of data, we offer Amazon Redshift, right? Um, for logging, Amazon S3, as you know, it's object storage, uh, and you can put any sort of logs on Amazon S3. And for that, you don't need to really have a database, right? Um, any sort of elastic search, uh, any sort of reach search, you would use be you would be using the Amazon Elastic Search uh, services. Then, uh, for complex queries and transactions, um, Amazon RDS is offered, which is the relational database services, um, and you can have different flavors of relational database here as well. You can have my C, uh, uh, MS SQL. You can have. Uh, Oracle as well, running in Amazon RDS. And any sort of untampered data uh, would be Amazon QLDB. Uh, and then periodic data, as I was mentioning, would be Amazon Times, uh, Timestream. So these are the, the database services for the data tier, right? Hopefully this slide kind of gives a little bit of clarity when to use what kind of database services in AWS. So let's talk about relational database on AWS, right? Um, we saw like for complex uh, uh, queries and transaction, uh, relational databases are used, right? And I wanna go over um, what are those services, right? And how does it tie back uh, to some of the use cases, and also how does it tie back to your uh, AWS certification exam um, in the future as well. So three relational databases that are offered uh, in AWS. One is Amazon RDS, uh, one is uh, Amazon Aurora, and Amazon Redshift. So we'll go over the three of them. So. Uh, Amazon Relational Database, it's a managed relational database. Um, if, if you don't know what managed relational database, we'll talk about it uh, in the subsequent slides as well. But before we go there, let's talk about what, what are the choices of the database engines that you get with Amazon RDS, right? So you have, as I mentioned, Amazon Aurora, um, you also have MySQL, PostgreSQL, MariaDB, Microsoft SQL Server, and Oracle. So uh, customers that are running commercial databases, right, such as Oracle or MS SQL um, server on-premises, often cho uh, first choice is to go with Amazon RDS when they're migrating their databases, right? Uh, what Amazon offers uh, or AWS offers is a fully managed relational database service that you can use. Now, nothing stopping you in running these database engine on an EC2. Now, you can simply run them on an EC2 as well. And I'll go over uh, what are the some of the disadvantages of running databases on EC2. Um, what Amazon RDS is, is a managed service where you don't have to manage an OS, right? You don't have to manage a server. You simply run the database engine on, um, on Amazon RDS, whereas AWS takes care of everything uh, from the OS level, right? Even the hardware and everything uh, from that perspective. So all you get is the database engine, right? So um, Amazon RDS improves database scale and performance and automates time consuming administration tasks, such as hardware provisioning, database setup, patching, backups, all that stuff, right? So I'll go to the next slide. So if you were a database admin and an infrastructure person running a database on-prem, what would you be doing, right? So if you look at this slide here, there's a lot of things that you need to put in together to even run 
a relational database, right, on premise. So starting from the bottom, you have the power, then you have the rack, right? data center, but anybody who has an experience of working in a data center, um, there's a lot of racks, right? Racks have redundant powers, then there's cooling, there's HVAC, all sort of things. Then after that, uh, there's also OS installation before you could even put in what kind of database you want on that server, right? And with that, with OS, you would have OS patches, right? Security patches and whatnot. And then when you install the database, the database also have their software install, right? Oracle or Microsoft SQL, you have to set it up, install, configure. And then from time to time, you have to patch them, right? And then obviously, you know, you have to back up the database and also think of high availability, right? Or scaling up, right? And optimization. So all that that you need to cover when you're running a database on-prem, right? Traditional database on-prem. But if you're running a relation, sorry, let me, I went back. So in this model, right, what does AWS take care of, right? So AWS not only takes care of the power, the rack and stack, the server maintenance and OS installation, but all the other stuff as well, right? The OS patches in RDS, right? You don't have to worry about that. The database software installed, you don't have to worry about that. Software patches, even the backups, right, are automated. Uh, and it's high availability, right? You get to put it in, 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 in multi-availability zone, right? And scaling as well, right? So if your application needs to scale up and if you're writing a lot of data all of a sudden to your database, then RDS can, can scale up pretty fast, right? So that is where the managed RDS or managed database concept comes into play, right? because it's managed, all of this, these things are managed by AWS and you don't have to manage anything, right? All you do is you focus on app optimization, right? So what are the key Amazon RDS's feature, right? What are those feature for Ka RDS? Karish Bhai, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Aapne, aapne yeah. the local computer recording, right? You you're um, recording to the... I, I somebody started recording. I wasn't. I didn't click on the recording button. Oh, okay. I know see. I did not. Um, is that one by sure? Is that one by co-host? Is that one by? Joy Choudhury and Arab Jonasen mean. They do join record for this. Okay. 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 I don't see the recording button anymore because I guess it's, hold on. Record to the cloud. A left side open because- Yep, I got it. So it's it's recording to the cloud now. Awesome. We have to record to the to the local computer. I, I, change, I changed it, uh, Al-Bedabai. It's, it's recording to the cloud now. Then I'm both eight a cloud and a local computer record for the way. Oh, I see what you're saying. Hold on. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Yeah, no worries. Um, <clears throat> so going back to the uh, the RDS key features, right? Um, what are those three key features of RDS, right? You got. Um, uh, increase throughput, improve availability, and reduce late latency, right? Um, so push button scaling, uh, you also get the option to, to do read replica, right? So uh, in this picture right here, right, the second picture, right, you have the master node, right? And then you have the read replicas, right? So if your uh, application is, is querying uh, a lot of data, then you just simply go to the read replica, right? You don't need to hit your master for both read and write. Uh, so that's one of the key benefits or features of Amazon RDS. Um, and here you can see like this diagram at the right, uh, it kind of uh, 
multi-AZ or, or multi-availability zone, right? So here you can have a master, right, running in one AZ, and then you also have a read replica that can run in another AZ. Uh, so you can have different options and different way you want to set up, you know, your architecture for RDS. Um, and the last thing is the provision IOPS, right? Uh, so if you, if you need to reduce latency um, on your database and, and application, uh, you can go with provision IOPS as well, right? So those are some of the, the uh, RDS features or benefits, right, um, that Amazon or AWS offers. Um, part of the relational database uh, with RDS, there's also cloud native relational database, right? So what is, what is cloud native? relational database. So let's talk about that now. So um, we spent years, right? AWS and Amazon spent years building Amazon Aurora, right? Amazon Aurora is a MySQL and PostgreSQL compatible relational database built for the cloud, right? That combines the performance and availability of high-end commercial databases with simplicity and cost effectiveness of open source database. Some of the, the features of Amazon Aurora is, Amazon Aurora has five times the performance of a standard MySQL and three times the performance of a standard PostgreSQL with security, availability, and reliability of commercial gate database at one-tenth of the cost, right? Um, so if you think of it this way, right, you know, you don't need to run a commercial database with spending so much, so much dollar amount, right, on it, whereas you can run Amazon Aurora, right, with a one-tenth of that cost. So that's one of the key benefits, right? Uh, from a technicality perspective, right? Uh, what are the, the, the benefits or what does Amazon Aurora actually offer under the hood, right? Uh, so digging into that point, right? Uh, while we are compatible with MySQL and PostgreSQL, we have made a number of changes, right? Under the cover to deliver superior performance so that's one of the key concepts of Amazon Aurora, right? One is it's compatible with MySQL and PostgreSQL, right? And the second is um, if you need superior performance and availability, uh, then Amazon Aurora has made numerous changes to bring that, um, uh, bring those features to you. So what we have done is we have uh, separated the compute and the storage layer Right, so the compute layer, which I'll also call the head node, right, uh, going forward, includes the query processing, transaction, and caching layers in a traditional database, and is marked in blue on this diagram, right. So I will call that um, I'll call that the head node. The storage layer, which is the green section over here. The storage layer is a purpose-built log structured distributed storage system. It is a multi-tenant and spans hundreds of nodes distributed over three different availability zones. So you can think of an AZ as a fault isolated data center, right? And given, given Aurora database is split into 10 gigs of chunks, each 10 gig chunk is copied six times with two copies in each AZ or availability zone. So this sounds, uh, this sounds pretty interesting, right? For starters, you can lose an entire data center, right? Uh, as well as one more copy and still be able to recover your database, right? And, and I'll describe through this session that there are numerous innovations we can do to improve performance, availability, manageability um, for this architecture, right? So finally, you can add 15 read replicas that all sit on top of the same storage, right? Um, as I'll describe shortly on the features that customers love about Aurora, 
because your replicas with only 20 to 36 milliseconds lagged, they're very easy to scale, right? So that's the scaling out distributed and multi-tenant architecture with Amazon Aurora. So now we'll, we'll talk about everything you get from Amazon RDS, right? Uh, and Amazon Aurora as well. So we'll, we'll, we, we'll cover a few things here, right? You know, we covered the first, uh, the first diagram here when in a traditional model, you were running the databases on premises, right? And then I also talked about, there's nothing stopping you running an EC2 uh, with, with your preferred database engine, right? Uh, and that's the the second column here, right? You can you can install any database engine, Oracle, Microsoft SQL, as long as you have the license on EC2. But there's still a few things that you have to manage, right? When you when you install those database engines in your EC2, so anything that's in the white then becomes your responsibility, right? The starting from the OS patches all the way to app optimization. But when you go with RDS or managed by AWS, managed RDS, then all you have to focus on is your application optimization. You just focus on, on, your, on your transactions, on your queries, right? You don't have to worry about scaling, high availability, and everything that's in the orange is then managed by AWS. And there's few more, right? You know, we, we looked at RDS, we looked at Aurora, and with Aurora, you get more actually. Plus all that stuff that you saw in the orange that is managed by AWS, you get a lot more, right? So what are those lot more, right? So you can, we, we auto scale storage in 10 gigs of increments in Amazon Aurora, right? So you don't have to worry about pre-provisioning storage, right? So you don't have to set a storage um, when you deploy Amazon Aurora, right? You don't have to specify anything um, because it's, it's auto scale and, and we add 10 gigs of increments based on your usage. In addition to saving you time and effort with that, it also avoids downtime for scaling storage, which can be significant with MySQL databases. So I already mentioned uh, we can do continuous increment, right? Backups to S3, all you have to do is specify how far back you want to go. So that continuous backup and incremental backup is, is, is going into S3. Creating snapshot is instantaneous and does not affect performance. So you can create snapshots at any time uh, uh, during production hours or off production hours, right? And finally, your storage layer automatically handles things like hardware failure, so you don't have to worry about it. So if there was a hardware failure on the AWS side, uh, because the way the storage layer, as I was showing in the diagram with the read replicas um, and, 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 and moved over or spread across multi-AZ, any sort of hardware failure, even on the AWS side, your application or your database would be covered and there would be no downtime at all with Amazon Aurora. So those are the, the few things that I wanted to mention uh, regarding relational database with RDS and cloud native with Amazon Aurora. So let's talk a little bit about database backtrack, right? Uh, so what is backtracking, right? Backtracking rewinds the database cluster to the time you specify. Right, so backtracking is, is not a replacement for a backup of your database, just an FYI, uh, or your database clusters, uh, you can simply restore to a point in time. Right? A lot of people uh, uh, have worked with uh, Windows file server or, or any other uh, backup and storage solutions, right? You would have the option to go back point in time, right? Uh, especially with uh, VSS, right? Volume shadow copy in Microsoft file server, you can point it back to time. So this concept 
is very similar to that if anybody has used a Windows file server in the past, right? They can easily undo mistakes with this, right? If you have mistakenly program a, 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 an action that caused to delete, you know, some columns or rows or, or something, right? Or even your, you know, database cluster. So you can point it back in time with this. You can also backtrack the cluster quickly, right? And restoring the database cluster to a point in time and launch a new database cluster and restore it from the backup, right? You can also repeatedly backtrack a database cluster back and forth in time to help determine when a particular data change occurred, right? For example, you can backtrack a database cluster three hours and then backtrack forward in time one hour. In this case, the backtrack time is two hours, right? Before the original time. So if you wanna do a lot of, um, uh, <clears throat> when you're doing a lot of uh, trial and error and troubleshooting, this could come in handy as well. But, you know, um, I'm not going to spend too much time on that, on this, but it's just one concept that you may have to know or remember uh, for the certification exam. Um, the Most of the questions will surround around snapshotting, backup and restore, right? Um, the zero downtime patching or the CDP uh, feature uh, attempts on a best effort basis, right? So to preserve client connections through an engine patch, right? So if, if zero downtime patching is successful and application sessions are preserved and the database, the database um, um, engine restart, right? And can cause a, a throughput lasting approximately five seconds, right? So before the before the the ZDP, right, <clears throat> a lot of things would used to happen, right? If I just go with the with the um, with the diagram here, right, like you know earlier, right, if you wanted to do a, a, a zero downtime patching, there was no concept like that, right? Uh, you would have to uh, when you when you do when you do patching, you would have to terminate the sessions, right? Um, you have to restart, you know, there's a lot of things that would happen. So ultimately, the concept of zero downtime didn't exist. Now with, with Amazon RDS and, 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 and cloud, um, cloud native uh, relational database that AWS offers, right? Um, you don't need to, uh, you know, terminate a session when you're doing a patching, right? You can have sessions going into your database while you're doing the patching. Right. So <clears throat> imagine, right, you know, if there is a uh, if there's a compatibility issue or if, if there is a, a zero day attack, right, and a patch just came out and you have to deploy it, um, you don't have to terminate all the sessions, deploy the patches, right, and, and then and then take hours or, or even minutes, whatever that is to come back and, 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 and reestablish your session, right? So you can easily push those out without affecting anything in your application or even in the, in the user base. The other concept of RDS, the, or the features that are offered is, is fast database cloning. Um, so here you can, you can clone your database. You can quickly and cost-effectively create clones of all the database within your Aurora database cluster, right? The clone database require only minimal additional space when first created. And as you can see on the diagram, like the database cloning uses a copy on write protocol. So in which the data is copied in at the time the data changes, right? So either on the source databases or on the clone databases. So you can make multiple clones from the same database cluster. Right, so you can also create additional clones from other clones <clears throat> for more information, right? On how to copy on on write protocol works in the context of Aurora storage. I will share a link within this deck after the session that talks about copy on write protocol for database cloning. If you guys are are interested to know a, a little bit more about that, but for the purpose of today's session. And, and the certification exam prep, I'll, I'll move forward. Um, 
the next feature that Aurora offers is, is, is multi-master. Um, so multi-master is a new feature of, of Aurora MySQL compatible edition, right? So what does it do? It adds the ability to scale out uh, right performance across multi-AZ, allowing applications to direct read and write workloads to multiple instances in the database clusters that operate with higher availability, right? So meaning that if you have, if you have um, uh, application, right? And you wanna read and write to your database, you can actually do it into multi, across multiple availability zones. So you don't have to just focus on one AZ or you're not uh, restricted to one AZ. So that's one of the, the features of Aurora Multi-Master. Aurora uh, is also a global database, right? It consists of one primary AWS region where your data is mastered and then one read-only secondary AWS region, right? So Aurora replicates data to the secondary AWS region with, tip, with typical latency of under a second. So, you know, if you need, uh, if your application requires very low latency, that is where you would be using Amazon Aurora. Um, you issue write operations directly to the primary database instance in the primary AWS region. And Aurora Global Database use dedicated infrastructure to replicate your data, leaving database resources available entirely to serve the application workloads. So applications that has a worldwide footprint, right, um, can use reader instances in the secondary AWS region, right, for low latency. And, and in in the unlikely event your database becomes degraded or isolated in any AWS region, you can promote the secondary AWS region to take full read write workloads in under a minute, right? So you have almost zero downtime to your application at that point. The Aurora cluster in the primary AWS region where your data is mastered performs both read and write operations, right? So the cluster in the secondary region enables the low latency reads you need to serve uh, to read only workloads, right? Um, and also for disaster recovery, you can remove and promote the secondary cluster to allow full read and write operations. So it's a faster disaster recovery and also enhanced um, global database. So another concept, right? So Aurora serverless is, is, is uh, on-demand auto-scaling database for applications with variable workloads, right? So for example, you know, if you have um, startups on up on demand, right? Starts up on demand, so shuts down when not in use, right? You have that concept in EC2, some of you may be using with auto stop and auto start to save, uh, to save some on-demand hours, right? So uh, Aurora Serverless does the same thing, right? When you need it, it starts up. When you don't need it, it shuts down. It automatically scales with no instances to manage, right? So you don't have to manage a single instance, right? Um, and you know, when you're scaling up, there's no configuration, right? It automatically scales up. Um, from a, from a uh, pay per second for the database capacity use, it's, it's, you know, whatever you use in seconds, right? So if you're consuming something in seconds, that's what you're gonna pay for it. Uh, so that's where the concept of on-demand start and then shutting down when not in use comes into play. So uh, concept, on the Aurora serverless a little bit, right? Uh, it's good to know. Again, I will be providing some more additional topics and in-depth into this deck after, after this session when I share it with you guys. So the, the, the other one from the uh, Amazon relational database services, right? Is Amazon Redshift, right? Uh, a lot of you probably heard of this. Uh, it, you know, some of the features of Redshift is it's a, it's a petabyte, petabyte scale, um, um, massively parallel, right? 
uh, columnar store, relational data warehouse, right? Fully managed and no admins required to manage your data warehouse, right? Uh, you know, the concept of, of data warehouse, right? You know, where you bring in um, your data from different sources, right? Uh, most companies uh, will have scenarios where they're, they're not only bringing data from on-prem databases, right? But they're also bringing in data from SaaS applications like Salesforce or, or SAP, right? And they need to bring it into, into a data warehouse so they can do uh, analytics at the end, right? That's what's important uh, and, and then a concept uh, important concept of data warehousing, right? So what does what does Amazon Redshift does, right? As I said, it's a data warehousing, right? Uh, it's fast, it's powerful, and and simple data warehousing at one tenth of a cost. Um, it's really fast in terms of columnar storage, right? Um, I/O efficiency and parallel queries, right? Because uh, if you think of a data warehouse. Um, Apne might be doing uh, a lot of queries, right? And the queries could be coming in from different different sources. So it's important that you can accommodate those parallel queries and that's what Amazon Redshift provides. Um, from a cost perspective, uh, it's one-tenth the cost of traditional data warehouse solutions, right? Um, it's also scalable, right? you resize your cluster up and down and performance capacity needs as as your as your capacity changes right so you have that flexibility uh with with the redshift um and lastly which is very important um data encrypted at rest data encrypted in transit and you also have you can also do isolated clusters within your vpc and you can also manage your own keys as well with KMS. Um, how does a Redshift cluster architecture look like, right? Um, you know, we talked about it's massively fast, it's one tenth of a cost, you know, um, and you can run parallel queries, but, you know, how does that architecture look like in Redshift, right? Um, so if you, if you look at this diagram, right, you have the, you have the leader node, right? Um, which are your SQL endpoints, right? Uh, which stores the metadata and coordinates parallel SQL processing, right? And, and you also have the compute node at the bottom, right? The, what does the compute node do, right? It's, it's a local columnar storage. It executes queries in parallel, right? This is what I was talking about uh, a few seconds ago. It loads backups and restores, right? And it can do two sixteen and thirty two slices, right? But in in general, right? These are your nodes, right? That are executing those queries, right? And and when I was talking about the scaling up, right, of your nodes, um, and even shutting them down when you're not using it, this is where you would be doing that, right? Uh, in order uh, to uh, to scale up when you need and and not pay when you're not using it, right? So this compute node uh, in this section is where you would be doing that. It's a key concept, and you would get you know some questions on Redshift uh, at your uh, associate uh, solutions architect exam for sure. Uh, from the Redshift spectrum, right, you know, you can run SQL queries directly against data on S3 using thousands of nodes as well. So if you have data coming into S3, right, um, you, can, you can run those SQL queries, high concurrency, multiple clusters access the same data, no need for ETL, right? You query the data in place and, and using upon file formats, right? Um, full Amazon Redshift SQL support. Right, in terms of uh, uh, support and some of the, the cost optimization as well, right? So as I said, it was one-tenth of a cost uh, versus uh, traditional data warehousing. Um, fast, right? And it can scale up at exabyte scale, um, elastic and highly available, and on-demand and paper query, right? Those are the, the Redshift uh, features. 
I'll just go over the, the quick highlights of Redshift on this. Um, I will share this deck so you can read through it, but some of the quick ones, it's, it's, it's a managed data warehouse, obviously. Um, and, and with that meaning that you don't have to do patching, backup, right? Those sort of things are fully managed by this service. Uh, it also uses a distributed massively parallel architecture that I was showing, um, and it scales horizontally to meet the throughput requirements. Um, and Redshift is extremely cost-effective and can offer similar performance <clears throat> for one-tenth of a cost versus Oracle and some of the competitors as well. So those are the highlights. Now let's, uh, let's take a, a knowledge check, right? This will give us a, a quick break as we're doing these presentation and you're consuming it. Um, whatever concepts we just went through, we'll just do a quick knowledge check. And this time we are doing it a little bit different. We would be using the Zoom poll to do the knowledge check. So let me bring that up quickly. You should see uh, something come up on your screen, right? And the questions would be on the screen. Um, so the first question, let me know if you guys can see the first question in the screen. Yes. Yes. Okay. So the first question is, you can SSH into control the operating system where your Amazon RDS MySQL instance is running. A lot of people are answering the questions. Is it true or is it false? Can you SSH into RDS? Forget about everything else. Uh, I'll just focus on can you SSH into RDS? All right, so uh, almost, uh, almost, I would say 61% of you guys answered it false, which is the right answer. Um, Amazon RDS is a managed database offering, right? Uh, as you heard. So you cannot SSH into it, right? It's not an OS, right? That you can SSH into it. So basically what you do is, is, is you just simply get the, the database engine and you, and you have control of the RDS instance, right? Uh, but you cannot SSH into it. So that's the, that's the right answer. And most of you guys got it. So let me go to the second question that I have here. And I'll bring up the second question, which is this one. And let me launch the poll. So under what circumstances would I choose provision IOPS over standard storage when creating an RDS instance? Um, would I be using it for testing database environment? Uh, or if you have workloads that are not sensitive to latency or lag, or you would need to run an IO and test intensive relational database for mission critical application and production, or if you wanna do a business uh, trying to save money. Um, so let's see which one is the right answer. Most of you have started to answer it already. Under what circumstances would I choose provision IOPS over standard storage? <clears throat> That's the question. Assalamualaikum. Well, Waalaikum if 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 you can go and mute whoever's talking, that would be great. All right, so um, a lot of you have answered, and the right answer is C. So you know, if you need to run an I/O intensive relational database for mission critical application and production, right? So almost eighty percent of you have answered. C as the right question, uh, right answer. So great job, guys. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, I think we have one more for for this. Let me just double check. Um, 
yes, one more uh, before we we go into our next uh, uh, section. So let me launch the poll. So the question here is, which AWS service is ideal for business intelligence tools or data warehousing? Um, this should be a, a simple one, um, especially right after the uh, the last few uh, slides that we just talked about. Wow, 94% of you are answering Redshift and you are right. Redshift is the is the right answer for this. Um, it has Hi, not Shana. gone on to night. Yeah, go ahead. I like Tamuna, there's number, there's a poll number for after this as well. At least I seen this. Yeah, there's a poll. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I can see it. Yeah, thank you, Alvadavai. So there's one more. So let me stop this one. There's one more and then We'll go to the next section. Cool. Uh, so this one is which set of RDS database engines is currently available, right? So you have Aurora MySQL, SQL Server, Cassandra is one option, PostgreSQL, MongoDB as one option, then Amazon Aurora, MySQL, MariaDB, Oracle, SQL Server, and PostgreSQL as one option, and then MariaDB, SQL Server, MySQL, Cassandra as option number D. But the uh, the right answer is is C. It's is Amazon RDS supports Amazon Aurora, MySQL, MariaDB. Oracle, SQL Server, and PostgreSQL database engines. And the good news is most of you, almost 91% of you have answered it right. So fantastic going, guys. Uh, you guys obviously know more than me, I think, on the databases so far. So that's awesome. All right, so let me, uh, let me end the poll here. This was, uh, this was a great job, guys. Uh, so we'll move on to the next section, which is the, the NoSQL databases on AWS, right? Um, so some of the NoSQL databases on AWS, um, Amazon DynamoDB, Amazon ElastiCache, Neptune, um, then there's TimeStream, QLDB, and DocumentDB, right? As, as I mentioned previously, for the, for the sake of this call or the session um, and for your uh, certification exam, I may not be going through all of them, right? I will be touching uh, the main ones that you would be expecting in your certification exam. So let's start with that. Um, so first of all is Amazon DynamoDB, right? Most of you probably have heard about DynamoDB or maybe already working with it if you're if you're working with AWS right now. Um, so what is DynamoDB, right? It's a NoSQL database right off the bat, right? Uh, it's seamless scalability, right? You know, it's 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 managed. Uh, you don't have to do anything to scale up, right? There's no require for an administrator, right, to maintain this database. Um, it's single digit millisecond latency. It offers multi-master and offers multi-region as well, right? So those are some of the concepts, right? As I was saying, it's fully managed. It's consistently fast at any scale, right? Uh, if, you have, if you have a web application, right? Like think of it this way. If you have a web application, uh, it could be a, a video on demand, right? Like a, like a type of a Hulu or Netflix, right? Or it could be an e-commerce site, right? Uh, or it could just simply be a, 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 a order taking website, right? Like maybe you have a restaurant or anything like that. So think of those use cases, right? You don't need, um, you know, uh, you don't need transactions that are complex or queries that needs to be complex, right? You simply need to log in or write to the database for your customer order or for something like that. So that is where you would be using Amazon DynamoDB. Um, and there's plenty of use cases as well online, which I'll share it on the deck as well. But right off the bat, a few, few, few things that I wanted to mention, fully managed, very fast, highly available, 
and durable. Uh, it integrates very well with AWS Lambda and Amazon Redshift and some other services, right? Um, and cost effective as well. Security is built into all of the database services that AWS offers. So let's talk about high availability and dura durability uh, in terms of DynamoDB. Um, it's built in for high availability, right? It's designed to support 99.99% of availability. So four nines, right? The 99.99% of the time we are saying, or AWS is saying it's gonna be available to you or to your application. In terms of rights, it's a three-way replication persisted to disk, right? And it's a custom SSD. In terms of reads, right? Strongly or evenly consistent to no latency trade-off with DynamoDB. So what, what data is always replicated to three availability zones when you're using DynamoDB. So imagine that, right? If you're using DynamoDB and in one of the AZ went down, you don't have to worry about this at all, right? Because it's, it's always replicating to three AZs. So what happens when it comes to uh, when it comes to backup and restore, right? So um, the only cloud database to provide an on-demand and continuous backup, right? So that's important, right? Because you know continuous backup is a concept, you know, um, that's very new. Like when I was when I was working with with as a system engineer when I was when I had to maintain databases and back them up, this concept didn't exist back, you know, uh, 10 years ago, right? Um, so backing database was a major challenge and, and, and before patching, right? You know, because we were running databases on, on, on OSs and it would be a major, major challenge back then. But imagine if you had a process where you're continuously backing up, right? Um, and, and, and it also provides the point in time restore as well, right? So for short term retention and even data corruption, right? So you can go as much back as 35 days with DynamoDB uh, point in time. It also does the point in time recovery with restores uh, times in few hours, right? Depending upon how big your table size is. The global tables, right? So it's the first fully managed multi-master, multi-region database, right? Um, it's built on high performance. It can distribute global application, right? Uh, uh, low latency reads and writes to local and available. Like, so if you look at this, this, this diagram over here, right? So if you have a globally dispersed user, right, uh, users in Bangladesh, you know, users in North America, users in the UK, um, and, and, and they're all coming in from, from all these different region, um, and you have a global application with a global database footprint, right? So if you look at this diagram over here, right, and see how it's replicating to these different region, uh, along with your application. So users don't have to wait, right? So if you're residing in, in Bangladesh and you're using a global application, then you're not querying the database coming all the way to North America. You're probably doing it from some region in Asia, right? Uh, it's also very easy to set up and, and there's no application rewrites required. Acta Gautami Bulbo, like I'm not, I was never a, a database expert, right? Or, or, or I was never, you know, an AWS expert five years ago, right? Absolutely not. But the very first thing, Ami Jokon AWS Kora Shuru Korsi, I deployed a DynamoDB table, right? And it was so easy. It it doesn't require anything, right? There's there's no setup. There's nothing that you need to do to set up a DynamoDB table. That's how easy and simple it is. Just wanted to point that out. In terms of capacity, you know, uh, you know the way we have set up or, or configured DynamoDB, it's, its capacity is managed for you, right? So we have auto scaling, you know, for provisioned, 
um, and and it's it's a, it's a max governed max consumption, right? Set at minimum, and for on demand, like no limit. It starts at zero, right? And you can go as high as you can. Um, one of the main concept of DynamoDB is is there's two, right? And I'll go over the other one, and this is an exam question, a solutions architect associate exam question usually has this, the concept of DynamoDB streams, right? Where you capture changes as they occur. So what is DynamoDB stream, right? So DynamoDB stream captures a time ordered sequence of item level modification in any DynamoDB table and stores this information in a log for up to 24 hours. So application can access this log and view the data items as they appeared before and after they were modified in real time, right? So a stream, a DynamoDB stream is an ordered flow of information about changes to items in a DynamoDB table, right? If the items were changed in DynamoDB table, right, you can use DynamoDB stream, enable it on your table, right, and capture the information about every modification to the data items in the table, right? So think of it this way, right? If you're, if, if you're, if, if you run a, if you run a store and you take online orders, right, there's a lot of things that happens when a customer orders it online, right? Starting from searching the inventory to putting the order in, then, then pushing the order to, to the warehouse and then, then shipping it from the warehouse, right? So there's a lot, of, um, a lot of components that you go through. Now, if the table is constantly changing, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe when the customer ordered, the inventory had like two items, right? But by the time it was processed and, 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 and actually went to the warehouse, those two items were shipped out, right? So you see how constantly the data is changing, right? Between, um, between the order and, and shipping it out, that's where the DynamoDB stream comes into play, right? Where you can see the flow of information and then see what items were changed, right? You can enable the stream on a new table when you create it, or you can also enable or disable it on an existing table. The other key concept of DynamoDB is DynamoDB Accelerator or called the DAX. And this is again, a, a exam question. Um, for even more performance, right? Amazon DynamoDB Accelerator or DAX is a fully managed, highly reliable in-memory cache for DynamoDB that delivers up to 10 times performance improvements from milliseconds to microseconds. So, even at millions of requests per second, DAX does allow the heavy lifting required to add in memory acceleration to your DynamoDB tables without requiring developers to manage and cache invalidation, data population, or cluster management. So now you can focus on your application and for the customers without worrying about the performance and scale, right? So you don't need to modify application logic, right? Because DAX is compatible with existing DynamoDB API calls, right? So, you know, uh, if you're trying to scale up within, within seconds and you cannot have any latency, right? On that use case, you would be using the, you have the option to use the DynamoDB accelerator, right? Um, caching is the main concept here, right? If you need uh, to have a lot of read, right, on, on, on data over and over again, then you can do cache and file it. Then you can have cache the data uh, in DynamoDB Accelerator uh, in order to uh, reduce those latencies uh, from your application. So this, this two concept, DynamoDB Stream and DynamoDB Accelerator, are very important for the certification exam. Um, the next is, so what's the difference between RDS and DynamoDB, right? No SQL versus SQL. Um, and how do you choose which one to use, right? Kokon choose Corbin to use a DynamoDB or Kokon choose Corbin to use RDS, right? You know, we get that question a lot. Um, so 
for simplest possible database management, right? This is what I was saying earlier. No complex queries, right? No complex transactions. And you want the app to manage the database integrity, right? You want the application to do a lot of those. Then you would go with Amazon DynamoDB. Very simple, right? Again, there's there might be use cases, right? And 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 once you know all the concepts, it might be easier for you to to choose which one to use. But you know, um, for NoSQL, right? You would go with Amazon DynamoDB. Uh, anything that has that needs transactions, complex transaction, complex queries, joins, and frequent table scans, right? Anything that has to do with database engine to manage the database integrity, right? You don't want the application to manage the database integrity, and you don't have time for SQL skills, right? You would go with Amazon RDS. So. I wanted to put this slide in there so that you know it gives you a little bit more clarity on what DynamoDB does and what RDS does. All right, so quickly let's talk about the Amazon Elastic Cache, which is the in-memory key value store, right? That's another uh, service that we offer, right? So as technology and customer use cases have advanced, there has been an ever-increasing demand for increasing application processing speeds, right? Developers use various approaches to reduce the latency. Um, so this is where us is the new MS, right? Uh, so in-memory databases and data grids, specialized hardware such as multi-core processors and GPOs and accelerators are offered by Amazon Elasticash, right? So think of it this way, right? If you want, or you have a use case where you need to, where your application needs to process at speed, right? Um, and you you need, you know, uh, the database engines or the database architecture behind your application to respond to that speed, right? This is where the concept or the service Amazon Elasticash comes into play because it's a fully managed, hold on, sorry about that. I just went too far. It's a fully managed Redis or memory cached, mem cached, compatible, low latency in memory data store. So where does, does, does Elastic Cache then come into play, right? Amazon Elastic Cache, it's a web service that makes it easy to deploy, operate, and scale in memory data store in cache and in the cloud, right? So the service improves the performance of a web application, but by allowing you to retrieve information from fast managed in-memory data stores, right? Instead of relying entirely on, on slower disk databases, right? So application that supports, uh, Elastic Cache supports two open sources in-memory engine. One is the, the Redis, a fast open source in memory data store and cache, and then Amazon Elastic Cache for Redis it's, is, a, is a Redis compatible in-memory service that delivers the ease of use and power of Redis, right? So, so those are the, the two um, uh, compatible um, ones, so mainly Redis, right, is, is the main one. Um, so as I said, it's fully managed, uh, extreme performance, right? So your web application doesn't have to wait to process data, right? So think of like, you know, um, um, a booking site, right? When you're trying to book um, or even in, even an airline site, you know, busy season during summer vacation and whatnot. So those are some of the use cases there. Uh, again, it's fully managed, right? So you don't have to uh, do any hardware configuration or any kind of set uh, uh, configuration. Um, of to, to deploy Redis uh, or Amazon Elastic Cache. It's easily scalable, right? It reads scaling with replicas, write and memory scaling with, with sharding and non-destructive scaling, right? Um, other use cases, right? Mobile apps, uh, gaming uh, application, right? So any of you who are gamer, you know, and you need to, you know, play with your um, counterparts, right? In a, in a different, part of the world, right? Um, ad tech, IoT, 
right? These are the, the main use cases of Elastic Hash. Um, internet scale apps needed low latency and high concurrency. So some of the, the, the use cases again is so 1 million users, right? 1 million plus users, the data volume from terabyte to petabyte, right? And even more, uh, you wanna go global, right? Uh, Performance needs to be milliseconds to microseconds. Request rate is in millions, right? Uh, access to you know platforms such as mobile app, gaming, IoT, these sort of devices. Um, scale is opt out in, uh, pay as you go, and instant API access, right? Um, Amazon Elastic Cache for Redis, um, you know the fast one of the fast memory data store that provides sub millisecond latency, right? As, as I was showing it, but some of the key concept, um, I'll just quickly go through it for the sake of time. Um, key value store, fully managed, high available and easily scalable, right? The clusters with up to 6.1 terabyte of in-memory data, right? That's one of the, my favorite one and read scaling with replicas, right? Write in memory scaling with sharding as well. So I'll skip through this. A um, few examples here, right? For the for the for the Elastic Cache is, is if you look at the bottom here, right? Caching of MySQL database query results, right? Uh, caching of post processing results and caching of user sessions and frequently accessed data. So I'll I'll share. It will be on the slide, so you can take a look at some of these examples more more in depth. So let's do uh, one more knowledge check, right? Uh, I think we're doing good on time. Um, I will start the poll. Give me a second. So the next one is poll five. All right, so AWS's NoSQL product offering is known as what? A DynamoDB, RDS, MongoDB, or MySQL? All well, a lot of you go, a lot of you are answering the right one. It's DynamoDB. That's excellent, 97%. I'll end the poll. Looks like everybody um, everybody knows this one. We'll go to the next one, which is poll number six. And I'll launch it. So the question is, which of the following is not a feature supported by DynamoDB? Um, data reads that are either eventually consistent or strongly consistent Amazon DynamoDB supports MongoDB workloads. So this one is a little bit interesting. Like, you know, we got like 50-50 on, on this one. And, you know, 54% on data reads that are either eventually consistent or strongly consistent and so the question on this one is, which of the following is not a feature of uh, supported by DynamoDB? So the answer for this is actually B. Uh, Amazon DynamoDB doesn't support uh, MongoDB workloads. Um, so let me end that. And I believe that is, yep, that's that one. So, so the poll, I'll, I'll stop it. So we'll talk about um, we'll talk about an interesting concept, which is the migrating database to AWS. Right. Um, the reason I want to talk about uh, migrating databases to AWS is it's also a very important concept when it comes to AWS certification exam. Right. A lot of the organizations um, are 
either trying to migrate the databases to AWS or they have already migrated the databases to AWS. So in the past, you know, some of our customers um, uh, had trouble, right, migrating databases, right? Um, and, and what were those struggles? What were those challenges? The other key, key problem, Huechilo, to migrate the databases from on-prem to AWS, right? So um, very first thing is how will my on-premise data migrate to the cloud, right? How can I make it transparent to my users, right? These are some of the challenges that, that our customers were, were, were saying. And then afterwards, how will on-premise and cloud data interact, right? So imagine this, right? If, 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 if you migrate the data, right, to cloud, then you have some data on-prem, then you have some data on the cloud, and how would you interact, right? Um, how can I get help moving off from a commercial database? So that this, this question is, this is very interesting, right? So if you think of it this way, right, if someone's, wants to move away from commercial databases such as Oracle, right? Or such as Microsoft SQL, right? How do they, how do, they do that with AWS? And how can I move data to my data lake, right? Uh, so this is another one that's very important. You, you guys probably have heard or already reading about data lakes um, uh, and, 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 and how do I, the concept is how do I move the data into my data lake? I understand like, you know, the benefits of data lake, right? And what can I do with it? But the very first question is, I mean, I'm a data, keep up a data lake in Ejabo, right? I have to get my data into data lake first, right? So these are some of the challenges that we have heard from our customers, right? And what we did is, is we came up with a service that, directly addresses some of these concerns or some of these challenges that our customers faces today, right? Um, so we came up with Amazon uh, or AWS database migration services called DMS, right? Um, so before DMS, right, costly license intensive replication software to move data, you would need to go and buy something to move your data to the cloud. Uh, it wasn't simple, right? Those sort of setups with those those softwares would be very confusing. You have to spend hours and days and require like expert knowledge to, to even set up that environment, right? And the other thing would be long downtime, right? There is a longer downtime when you're doing database migrations um, with those tools. Um, and at the same time, customers, as I said, wanted to switch engines, right? So they wanted to get off commercial database, you know, to more AWS native databases or cloud native databases, right? So with all these factors, uh, the database migration services came along. What we did is we designed it to be simple, right? You can get started in less than 10 minutes with database migration service. It was designed to enable near zero downtime migration, right? And it was also designed to be kind of a replication um, Swiss Army, right? Uh, to replicate data between on-premise systems uh, such as RDS, EC2, and across database engine, right? One of the, the other uh, service along with uh, DMS is the schema conversion tool, right? So the schema conversion tool converts your commercial database and data warehouses schema to open source engines or AWS native services. So this is what I was talking about where some of the customers, they wanted to get off from a commercial database to more of an open source or cloud native or AWS native services, right? So these com combination of these two helps the customer to achieve not only just migrating, but also moving to a to a different database engine altogether. So how does how does that work, right? Um, this diagram kind of talks about that a little bit, right? How does the the migration process, um, the database migration process work? So the step one is is convert or copy your schema, right? So when you're when you're copying your schema, right, 
you're using the uh, the native tool and you're pushing you know the schema or you're copying the schema to your destination database, right? But when you're using the copy or convert, that's where the the SCT tool comes into play, right? That I was talking about, where it actually converts the schema, so you can actually use a an open source or AWS native database engine, right? And the step two is is moving your data, right? Very simple. Convert or copy your schema, then move the data. So in here, right, in this diagram, the next step is where you're actually moving your data, right? You're moving your data to a destination database or you're moving your data to a data warehouse, all right? Um, and you need to you do need to do the schema conversion as well, right? Um, and 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 then move it to the destination database. If you're going from Oracle to, for example, an open source database engine, right? So this is where you would use the AWS SCT to, for the conversion of the schema and to migrate the data, you would be using the database migration service. Uh, this concept is important. Uh, you would definitely get at least one or two questions regarding data mi database migration uh, in your certification exam. So let's go through the summary, right? Um, I, we, have, we have gone through the same slide at the beginning of this session, right? Um, but um, let me walk through what have we covered and what what we what we haven't covered, right? So we covered we talked about Amazon RDS, which was the managed relational database service. Then we talked about what's offered as cloud native by AWS for relational databases. Uh, we did look into Amazon Redshift. Uh, for database warehousing or data warehousing. Um, we also looked and, and, and into DynamoDB, um, and we also looked into uh, Amazon Elastic Cache for in-memory key value store. What we haven't talked about is some of the other services such as Neptune, TimeStream, um, Ledger Database, and DocumentDB. Um, for the sake of the time, and I also know that, you know, Maghrib is coming up, I believe, uh, uh, you know, very soon um, in, in Dhaka or in Bangladesh. So that is why I wanted to uh, kind of skip through some of these, but I did add them into the into the the slide deck. So when you when we do share it, you would see uh, and can go through some of these services, right? Um, and at the same time, I wanted to focus on what's um, what's important in the certification exam, right? And also give you guys some time to ask questions. I know you may be asking questions in the chat, uh, but I wanted to also open it up for asking any questions later on. Um, for the next step though, I would like to go through some sample uh, questions that usually um, are very similar to ones that comes in the solutions architect associate exam related to database, right? So let's go through those. Those are a little bit different than some of the quizzes that we have been, uh, we have been uh, taking. So let's take a look at those. Karish Pai, before you uh, squeeze it out again, can I just ask people to fill in the survey question? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, the, um, Sami, it's good to see. Um, uh, it takes only a few seconds. After the uh, few seconds, need to fill up for them. Tahle, I'm wrapping the feedback. Gulo need to pay. Ebang, in our goal to make this better. Yeah, uh, after the journey, it's a useful session. Hi, tahle, just after the step, after the feedback, to incorporate for the next session, a other session. So, it takes only a few seconds, if you don't mind. After you take two shawai niye, um, it fill up kore dan akun. We we love to help you um, and make it better. You know, inshallah, another future session go la. Take two shawai niye, just fill up kore dan, please. We we'll just give it uh, maybe half a minute or a minute, Karish uh, bhai. Then we will. Start. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everybody. 
আর আমাদের নেক্সট সেশনটা হচ্ছে নেটওয়ার্কিং এর উপরে ইনশাআল্লাহ নেক্সট ফ্রাইডেতে দ্যাটস আ রিয়েলি ইম্পর্টেন্ট সেশন অ্যাজ ওয়াল কারণ নেটওয়ার্কিং টা ইটস ফোকাস কোয়ার বেড সলিউশন আর্কিটেকচার অ্যাসোসিয়েট এক্সামে তো প্লিজ আপনার সময় থাকে প্লিজ জয়েন আস নেক্সট ফ্রাইডে দ্যাট উইল বি এ ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট সেশন Karish, I think we can start. Uh, sure. already, thank you so much. Uh, please uh, do it as uh, before we wrap it up. Also, I mean, Slack channel post Corbone. Uh, this is Im very important because with this input, we can also, when I'm AWS management team, we can showcase, you know, how, um, how in eager you all of you are. Huh? And then you know we can build other sessions based on top of this section. Then ultimately our other goal, the Aptana Shawai certification event, and you would go, get into the cloud field, right? So all this feedback would help drive future sessions as well. So thank you all. All right, cool. So thank you, Alveda Pai. Um, so let's go with the uh, with the first question. Um, I'll, I'll read the question first, then I will start the poll, right? Um, so let's go with the first one. You work for an advertising company that has a real-time bidding application. Um, you're also using CloudFront on the front end to accommodate a worldwide user base. Um, your users begin complaining about response times and pauses in real-time bidding, right? What is the best service that can be used to reduce DynamoDB response times by an order of magnitude, milliseconds to microseconds? So let me launch the poll. So the issue the users are complaining about is response times and pauses, right, in real-time bidding. A lot of you are already answering and I can see that, you know, 61% um, of you are answering C which is DAX, and that is the right answer. So Amazon Database Accelerator is, a, is fully managed, right? We talked about this, it's high available, it's in-memory cache, right? That can reduce Amazon DynamoDB response times from milliseconds to microseconds. So that is the key concept of this question, right? Is in terms of the, the um, the millions of requests that are coming in. So if you're running a bidding application, right, there's a lot of people bidding, right? And it's a lot of requests coming in. So the right answer is DAX and 68% uh, of you answered it correctly. So great going. Um, I'll end the poll. 
share the results, right? This is, uh, um, as I said, 68% of you answered it right. So let me go on to the, the next one. And I will launch the poll. So a solutions architect has been assigned the task of helping the company development optimize the performance of their web application. End users have been complaining about slow response time. So if you have a, you have a web application and the users are complaining about slow response times, the solution architect has determined that improvements can be realized by adding Elastic Cache to the solution. What can Elastic Cache do to improve performance on this scenario? So A is queue up request and allow the processor time to catch up, right? Queuing up the request and, and, and waiting for the processor to catch up, right, basically. Or B, offload some of the right traffic to the database, right? C, deliver to 10 times performance improvement from milliseconds to microseconds or even at millions of requests per second or cache frequently access data in memory, right? Those are the options. Um, the right answer for this one though is D. D is the correct answer, cache frequently access data in memory. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why, right? The, the reason is if you read the, the question here, right? There's two main concepts in here. One is the slow response time and the other is, um, you, know, you know, it's a web application, obviously, and, and it's already saying that the Elastic Cache is the way to go, right? But why is it the way to go, right? Um, and with the slow response times, right? And if you remember with Elastic Cache, you can frequently access data in memory, right? That's the concept of Elastic Cache. So, if you read some of these answers, right? For example, queue up request and allow the processor time to catch up. That is not a concept, right, of Elastic Cache. So it's already, you can already eliminate that, right? Offload some of the right traffic to the database, right? Like if you go back to the question, right? There's nothing that talks about that the user is, or in the web application that the user is actually writing anything, right? It's all about read, right? Because and, and they're getting slow response time. So you can eliminate this one as well, right? And and this one that number C that talks about delivers up to 10 times performance improvement from milliseconds to microseconds, right? Um, again, it doesn't it doesn't answer the question about complaining about slow response times, right? Yes, great. There's performance increases, right? But does it does it uh, help me with slow response times or not, right? So as, as you're taking these exams, right, you can do a process of elimination just by looking at the question and looking at the answers, right? So um, with this one though, I see that 82% of you actually answered D, which is the right answer. So great going, so I'll end the poll and I'll share the results so everybody can see it. 82% uh, of you answered it right. So perfect. Let's go on to the next question. Um, there's two more. So I'll launch the poll um, and I'll read the question. So a financial institution has an application that produces huge amount of actuary data which is ultimately expected to be in the terabyte range. There is a need to run complex analytic queries against the terabytes of structured data using sophisticated query optimization, columnar storage on high performance storage and massively parallel query execution. Which service will, be, will best meet this requirement? So the options are Elastic Cache, BRDS, C DynamoDB, or D Redshift. Columnar storage, uh, 
some of the key things from the questions. It needs to run analytic queries. That's another key um, concept on the question that can give you an answer, right? So those are the, the key things and parallel query execution, right? The three things from that, from the question that you can, that you can identify the answers below. So um, the right answer is, is, is option D, right? Um, and, and as I was saying, the reason it's the right answer is some of the things in the question that you can just read through. Yes, it's a paragraph, right? It talks about a financial institution. It talks about that institution has an application that produces huge amount of actuary data, right? All that stuff. But the key concept there is it, it's, it, 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 it talked about analytic queries. It talked about uh, columnar storage on high performance and then parallel query execution. Those are the three things that can lead you to an answer, which is Redshift. And 70% of you actually answered it right. So fantastic going with that. So we have one more. I'll launch the poll so you can start and I'll lead through. So your company has performed a disaster recovery drill, which failed to meet the recovery time objective or RTO desired by execu executive management. The failure was due in large part by the amount of time taken to restore proper functioning on the database side. You have given management a recommendation of implementing synchronous data replication for the RDS database to help meet the RTL. Which of these options can perform synchronous data replication in RDS? So the options are RDS multi-AZ, DAX, read replicas, AWS database migration. Um, some of the key giveaways from this one, you know, again, on this synchronous data replication is important, right? Um, it talked about that they did a DR drill and they didn't meet the RTO, right? Most companies that are, that are regulated, non-regulated, right? You know, but any publicly traded company, right? They go through a disaster recovery drill and it's best practices for any organization to go through a disaster recovery drill, right? Um, and it talks about that, hey, you know, this company did a drill and, and they failed on the RTL, the recovery time objective. Um, so now, you know, the management has taken this and said like, look, you know, come up with a solution, like, you know, to better focus on how we can improve on the RTO, right? So the key giveaway here is, is the synchronous data replication, right? With RDS multi-AZ, right? You're actually, synch you know, asynchronously replicating your data to another um, RDS in another AZ, right? So your recovery time objective cuts down in short, right? Uh, and you would definitely be able to meet that. So the right answer is obviously uh, ARDS multi-AZ. You can also do process of elimination just by looking at the answers. Uh, like for example, DAX. Um, DAX you know, is a DynamoDB concept, right? Uh, it doesn't exist in, in RDS. Um, AWS database migration service is, is not gonna help you when it comes to uh, disaster recovery, right? because uh, database migration service is mostly for migrating your data into the cloud or converting your schema if you wanted to go from one um, a commercial uh, database engine to, a, uh, to, a, to another cloud native uh, database engine in AWS. So, so you can do process of elimination there already, right? And your yeah, right answer is RDS multi-AZ. Um, and most of you actually answered it right. Um, I'll share the results. 72% of you answered it right. So great going on this one. Um, I'll stop sharing. I'll end the poll as well. 
So uh, some additional resources, guys, before you go. Um, I know we are, we are coming, coming to uh, Namaz prayer time very soon. Um, for the deep dive on specific services and database use cases, uh, there's some links that I have provided here. Um, you can look at the blogs, you can look at the online tech talks. Um, I'll share this deck so you have all these links with you. Um, and then we also would be giving the event engine, right, um, as well. I think you guys have used that in the, in the previous session as well. Um, so we would be providing that for you to go in hands-on, uh, bring up some RDS, bring up some DynamoDB in that lab, right, and play with it, right? It will be open for 48 hours. Um, and if you guys have any issues accessing event engine, uh, do reach out to me on Slack. Um, and also, we also have hands-on tutorials, right? You can go in and look at uh, um, getting started as well. And there's also RDS labs available in A Cloud Guru as well. So if you take the A Cloud Guru certified um, associate course, um, you can also uh, get a lab there. But I would definitely recommend that you take advantage of the event engine uh, that we're going to share on the Slack channel. Um, it's free, you know, um, and it's available for 48 hours. So you don't need anything else to uh, to go in and play with. Uh, uh, RDS, DynamoDB, or any other AWS database services. Arish, bhai, after ki link to handy yes, we take it. Yes, yes can I ch can. Ch ch chat di di and then everybody yep. can grab it from there too. Our um, Dinesh, Tarek, bhai, apne to asen na. Zumi, I see you responding. Hi, Achi. Apne just uh, want to introduce yourself quickly. I know you've been a big part of this uh, organizing this. Do you just want to come on to the video uh, and just introduce yourself and, and a session that you're going to be doing? Uh, yeah, sure. Give me just a moment. Let me sit for us to sit on the video. Check another Zoom on. Right, and so thank you, uh, Karaj Bhai. It was an awesome session. I know people uh, loved your session. Um, I know you spend a lot of time <laughs> doing, uh, getting ready for this, prepare for this. So um, uh, thank you so much. No, absolutely. Uh, it's my pleasure. Um, and, and just FYI, guys, I did put the, the event engine hash on the chat. Right? So if you click on it, you should, you should be able to use it, right? Any issues with it, just let me know. Um, and I will be available on Slack to answer any questions as well. video key on Okay. Yeah, we can see you. Uh so everyone. Uh I'm on Namucha Dari Khabib. Um you Babu Bhai Tarpore Karish Bay Shawashate Katsuri as a business architect. Um you hold a US based Virginia. So yeah, our next session is on networking. So I'm just looking forward for everyone to see the next session. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With that note, uh, I'm Mark Rebe Shumacho. So again, I'm going to say thank you very much. I'm going to say thank you very much. But um, inshallah, we will you know, continue to work with you. Um, and after you have a question, I will answer the Slack ping current. We'll answer, um, you know, to our best of our abilities. So thank you so much again. Uh, Karish, any last last uh, words before we wrap up? Uh, yeah, I mean, just, just one last thing. Um, as you know, like, you know, the session that we just went through, right, um, may not cover everything, as I've been saying, right? But the important thing is, is that it will cover the certification exam, but I do highly recommend is for you to go in and, and, and start reading some documentation, some links that I'm going to share on the deck and as, as well as use the, the labs, the event engine, right? Because if you do it yourself, right, it makes it a lot more easier, right? Amar for me, 
আমি যেভাবে এক্সাম নিতাম ইস টু অ্যাকচুয়ালি প্লে ইন দ্য ল্যাব ওখানে আমি বিল করতাম দেন আই অলসো ইউজ টু টেক আট অফ স্যাম্পল এক্সাম কোয়েশ্চেন এজ ওয়েল লাইক ইন ওয়েজ ল্যাবস ওর এ ক্লাউড গুরু and that's how i i i was able to uh pass my certification so just a just a uh uh you know a little tip on that uh but other than that it was great talking to you guys um good luck and if you have any questions then reach out to me on slack and thank you albeda bhai for organizing 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 it and zaman bhai as well thank you that that how inshallah our kotha inshallah next uh, even engine or running it even engine to start course len na karish bhai uh yes it's started it may take few minutes to come up right but it's That's already right. started yep okay good so give awesome. it a few minutes uh, give a few minutes to start up